Video games are becoming increasingly difficult to get into. So how do you get your friends and family, or yourself if you are the friend or family, into one of the world's most popular and exciting hobbies? Keep watching to find out. Salutation subjects. In my family, I'm basically the only one who plays video games. My dad played Doom back in grad school, I think my mom might still play Candy Crush, and my eldest sister has been known to play a Telltale Choose Your Own Adventure game from time to time when I suggest them. But otherwise, I'm the only gamer in the family, so I know what it's like to have friends or family that just don't know how to interface with games. That said, I often find myself thinking about how I would introduce my family to video games if I had the chance, and I wanted to share my ideas with you guys in case you have friends or family that you want to introduce to your favorite hobby, or if you yourself want to learn more. There's a series of videos from Rasputin about how his wife, a non-gamer, reacts to a variety of games and how she was able, or unable, to play them. I think it's a great and insightful series of videos, and I recommend them for their entertainment value alone, but I think his shotgun approach wasn't the best for accessibility and staying power. Going into this video, I'm considering the best options for players who don't play video games at all. For players who pick up a Wii remote and immediately crash their Mario Karts into the wall. Which is, again, a direct call to my dad. You see, every piece of media requires some level of literacy. A child can't just pick up to kill a mockingbird and be expected to understand what's going on. They need to understand what chapters are, how point of view works, how to parse and decipher nuanced layers of social interactions. Video games are the same way, but because they're an interactive medium, I'd argue they require more involved skills to appreciate. What this means is, to the best of my ability, is picking video games that stick to the lowest level of interaction required to enjoy the experience, to help build a foundation that you can transfer to other more complex games. I think more seasoned gamers could easily make the argument that some of the games on this list aren't even technically games, and honestly I'd agree with them, but the goal is to help teach new players the fundamentals of control and structure so that they can get their sea legs, so to speak. This also means avoiding action games, games that require the player to keep track of a lot of information at once, games with a 3D camera, games with time limits or the fear of death, while these all may seem like foundational to a lot of players, it's hard to enjoy Doom if you don't know how to use WASD or even understand what a first person camera means in the context of controlling a character. I also tried to keep everything to the same system, in this case a low-end PC. If a game has a good mobile port, then that's even better, because they're often just as, if not, available. I also wanted to consider games that have a lot of easily transferable affordances. In design, an affordance is the possibility space that a person can perceive based on prior experience and knowledge. So for example, people across cultures are familiar with sports that involve getting an object, usually a ball, into a zone. So Pong might be a great first intro to gaming for some people, because it's really easy to play and affords the player with options they can easily understand. Finally, I also want to showcase a large array of games. I love the gaming landscape, and I want to show off the fact that we're far away from the days of bleeps and bloops and games set in space just because black backgrounds were easier to render in the arcade days. At the end of each suggestion, I'll also list a bunch of other games that you can try if you liked playing the suggestion, although these will often require a bit more skill and coordination to play. Consider them like joining a league after playing a sport at recess, or taking music lessons after learning a song on your own. Okay, with that all in mind, let's jump into the list. First up on our list is a computer lab classic, Clicker Heroes by Playsaurus. Clicker Heroes is almost entirely UI based. UI stands for user interface. It's basically just all the information given to you, the user, on the screen. You start out as a lone adventurer named Sid, taking on classic role playing game monsters like slimes. But as you defeat monsters and gain gold, you can upgrade skills to grow stronger. Eventually, you can unlock and hire more adventurers, and even gods, to help fight alongside you. Plus, after a few minutes of playing, the game effectively starts playing itself, which is why it's known as an idle game. It's great to have up in the background while working, plus it continues even if the game is closed. There are no controls other than clicking on buttons, which means controlling the game is extremely easy. There's also no timer or way to lose the game either, so there's no pressure to succeed or hurry. If you do get to a boss level and don't have enough strength to beat it in 30 seconds, you can just go to the level before it and grind some more until you do. This is perfect for players who don't yet know how to interpret interfaces for games, but don't want to be overwhelmed. There are also several fundamental video game ideas here. Combat, experience, upgrades, boss battles, optimizations, and more. Honestly, this choice was a toss-up between Clicker Heroes and another fan favorite, Cookie Clicker by Ortail. Instead of fighting monsters and leveling up, you're baking cookies and hiring grandmas for their intense, pastry-based labor. If you're a fan of anime tropes and silly writing, you can also consider Sad Panda Studio's Crush Crush, which is an idle game which also serves as a nice gateway into the dating sim genre. 
game sees you working odd jobs, raising your stats, and courting a bunch of weird women who you run into during your jobs. If you find idle games too uninvolved for your tastes, then I recommend Bloom's Tower Defense 5 by Ninja Kiwi. I think Bloom's Tower Defense 5 is a little bit more beginner friendly, with tons of options to choose from to help tailor the experience to your liking. In BTD5, you're a commander of specially trained monkeys trying to stop an increasingly large amount of balloons from floating down a path to the finish. You win the game if you can last a certain amount of rounds, but you lose if a certain number of balloons is able to sneak past you. If you're confident in your ability to use a mouse and navigate an interface, but want a game that challenges you a little bit more, then the next few games are for you. Before we discuss those though, please consider liking and sharing this video with your own friends or family. It would really help me reach more people and bring the world of gaming to new players, which I think is always a great thing. So there's a controversial genre of adventure games known as walking simulators. The term was originally derisive, lambasting these games, or interactive narratives, for their slow pace, lack of involved mechanics, if there even were any, and emphasis on story rather than gameplay. I think over the past several years though, games belonging to this genre have truly carved a space for themselves, integrating mechanics into their stories in unique and interesting ways. For that reason, I recommend these two games, Gone Home by Fulbright, and What Remains of Edith Finch by Giant Sparrow. If you're not familiar with movement in a 3D game, then definitely start with Gone Home, as What Remains of Edith Finch builds upon what you'll learn in Gone Home. If you're a veteran gamer and you haven't played Gone Home yet, then skip ahead until this red square is no longer on the screen. But for newbies, I do need to spoil something about the game to make it more accessible. Gone Home initially builds itself as a horror game, but I'm going to tell you right now that it's not. Part of the experience is wondering whether or not there is something horrific, but if you're playing a game like this for the first time, then I think the stress of learning to control the character on top of the stress of some perceived threat is just too much. Okay, with that out of the way, you play as Katie Greenbrier, a woman returning to an empty family home in Oregon in the mid-1990s. Katie just graduated college and went on an international trip throughout Europe, and is exploring this new house for the first time. The game is less about Katie herself though, and more about her family, especially her younger sister Sam. Sam has left a journal for Katie to read as she explores the house, and as you interact with certain objects, pages from the journal will be read aloud. I used to tell you everything, and if I can't do it in person, because you're off gallivanting around who knows where, I'll tell it to this journal just like I was talking to you. The more you explore, the more you start to learn about the family's dynamics and the underlying, and sometimes overlying, tensions that they're struggling with. In order to play, you'll have to familiarize yourself with 3D game controls, moving the first person camera, interacting with objects in the environment, navigating the options menu to turn on the legible fonts. These are all really integral skills to learn for 3D games, and Gone Home gives you a safe environment to learn them in. I'll be honest though, because of the minimal amount of unique mechanics in the game, I do recommend getting the game when it's on sale. This next game, however, I can wholeheartedly recommend at full price. To me, What Remains of Edith Finch builds upon the foundation set by Gone Home beautifully. Not only does the game upgrade the setting from Oregon to Washington, it also introduces a more dynamic and compelling narrative that very skillfully weaves mechanics into the storytelling. A lot of this isn't going to make sense to you, and I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to start at the beginning, with the house. In the game, you play as the eponymous Edith Finch, one of the few remaining members of a family seemingly cursed to die in mysterious ways, with only one family member of each generation surviving. The story has a melancholic tone, and uses magical realism to amplify the lived, or I guess the dying, experiences of each member of the family. As you explore Edith's familial home, which fittingly also has a lot more architectural and interior design character than Katie's, another point in the game's favor, you learn about your family's tragic lives and live out each extended family member's final moments. These vignettes all feature unique mechanics and methods of telling the story. In one, you're simply swinging in a tree, while another has you transforming into different animals in a poison-induced hallucination. It's a really fascinating game, and at about three hours long, it's perfect for a rainy afternoon. After playing through these games, you should be a lot more comfortable with a mouse and keyboard or controller, and should also be comfortable moving in 3D space. With that in mind, I have a lot of options depending on what you found enjoyable. For example, did you like moving around and interacting with the environment? Do you like the more gamey aspect with a sprinkling of narrative? Then you might like to push your skills further with Portal, developed by Valve, which is a relatively short game about solving small puzzles that challenges your sense of 3D space. For a game you can play with others, consider Escape Simulator by Pine Studio, a game with several escape room scenarios to explore and solve. For something with a more emotional, narrative-heavy focus, you can't go wrong with Telltale Games' The Walking Dead, which is just so much better than the show. Like, seriously, just listen to 15 seconds of this song. It tells you all you need to know.
Jared Emerson Johnson, you are a madman. It also features Lee Everett and Clementine, who are two of the best characters in video games and just, ugh, I love this game so much. If narrative games aren't really your thing though, you might like this next suggestion, which is a lot more frenetic while still being beginner friendly. This is Vampire Survivors, developed by Ponkel. To the untrained eye, it might look very confusing and very old, but it's actually a very simple game to pick up, and it came out in 2022. Good for it. Happy Pride Millennia. It's the pioneer in a new series of games under the action roguelike genre. That sentence alone has a lot of heavy lifting to do, but newbies don't have to worry about that for now. What you need to know is that the game starts out like this, and all I'm doing is moving my character around. See? What makes this genre, and this game specifically, so great for new players is that the controls are super easy to learn, but the game has a surprisingly high amount of content hidden away behind its achievements. For those who don't know, there's an online game store called Steam. You can buy tons of games on Steam, including all the games I've mentioned in this video. Check the description for a link to all of them. When you perform specific actions in different games, you earn achievements, which you can either show off on your profile or hide in shame so that no one knows you played that game. Vampire Survivors does something really cool, where every achievement you unlock in Steam is tied to an unlockable in the game. This could be new characters, new weapons to fight off the hordes of enemies, or new features like a level map. Other games in this genre are also starting to emerge. For example, this is Elemental Survivors. I was given a free Steam key by the devs at Sam OB Games to show off what makes it unique. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to showcase it. The game includes elements that set it apart from Vampire Survivors and other games in the genre, such as party members that follow you, boost your stats, and attack alongside you, elements such as fire that affect attacks, damage, and status effects, D&D style stats that affect your character, and more. If you've tried out Vampire Survivors and decided it was up your alley, make sure to try out games like Elemental Survivors and Mob Mania by Asian Desserts, Just JM, and Wolf Bite 131, which adds a multiplayer twist on the formula. If you like this game but want a little bit more control over your character and choices, you can also try out top-down dungeon crawlers like Enter the Gungeon. Just keep in mind that these games will be a little bit more involved. If the games I'm recommending are like playing during recess like I mentioned earlier, then top-down dungeon crawlers are like the local league games. So, those are my picks. If you're someone who doesn't game, or has friends and family that don't game, I recommend giving some of these games a shot. I didn't get to talk about farming RPGs today, but if you're interested in a low-key genre about managing crops and making friends, then you might be interested in this video too. I actually didn't get to mention a lot of the games I wanted to recommend, so if you're interested in another video like this, make sure to let me know in the comments. As always, thank you to my beautiful, lovely supporters over on Ko-fi, and I'll see you all later!